Now, as a way of background, um, I live in Stanford, California. Um, and Stanford, California is best known, I think, because it is the next town over from Mountain View, California. Mountain View. Um, and I presume that most of you recognize Mountain View. Um, Mountain View is the home of Google. Um, <clears throat> and the reason why I bring that up is that I'm going to start with what I think of as the Google Earth view of education. So if all of you who have Google Earth on your computer, you start about at Saturn and sort of float in to whatever address you want. And you could float into the Kansas City Public Library um, on the Google spaceship. Um, I'm going to float into American public education starting at about Saturn for, in many ways. Um, uh, and then try to get down a little closer to Earth, but I probably won't land the craft, uh, I'll tell you now. Um, let, me talk, let me mention what I'm going to talk about. The questions that I have for tonight, um, I'm going to try to answer four questions. One is, does achievement matter? Um, and you might say, well, what a, what a silly kind of thing to start a talk about. You're all here because you know achievement matters. Um, the reason why that's up there is that I'm going to try to convince you that you've all underestimated the importance of achievement. And so my task here is to say that, well, you think it's important, but you don't think it's important enough. And it's more, much more important. Um, the second is, is the US competitive? Thirdly, a little bit closer to home here, is how is Missouri doing? And then fourthly, are there things to be done? So those are the topics I want to cover, and, the, and we'll get into, obviously, teacher quality, since that was in the title as we go along. But I should say, I, I'm not sure if I should say this in a library. I never know what I should say in a library, what's, what's legal or not. Um, but I hate people who give talks as if they're mystery novels. Um, and they're going to play this out over time. So the answers are, are here um, <laughs> are very clear. The answers are yes, no, not so well, and yes. So if you'll remember those answers, I'm going to fill in some details to those answers as we go along. I hope that's OK, Crosby, that I give the, the punchline first. Yeah. Uh, OK. <laughs> Now, interest in education is not a new thing, um, as you might know. I'm going to give you a little bit of history. Um, many people who talk about education reform started in 1983 with a major government report called A Nation at Risk. That report was remarkable as a government report because it was written in such flowery, flowery language. Um, <clears throat> it, talked, um, if a foreign power imposed our education system on us, we would declare it an act of war. And things, statements like that, and talk about the rising tide of mediocrity and so forth. Um, George H.W. Bush convened all of the governors um, in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, to talk about education in 1989. It was a remarkable event because governors don't show up for anything, right? And um, they all showed up and they sort of at the end agreed that the US should be first in the world in math and science in the year 2000. Okay. Um, Bill Clinton followed that up with actual legislation and discussions about the Goals 2000 Act, which was designed to push US education to reach the goals set uh, at the prior governor's meeting, where, where he went as a governor, and then took up uh, the case as uh, the president. Um, George W. Bush introduced No Child Left Behind, where by the year 2013, all students should be proficient. 
Um, President Obama, in his 2011 State of the Union address, basically said, we know what it takes to compete for jobs in industries of our times. We need to out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build the rest of the world. So there's a, quite a consistent story here. Um, the only thing that I have to add to this part of the story is that this is 2015. And we've seen all these dates that have been up there that we have missed along the way. Now there's another uh, final quote that I'll give you. Um, Condoleezza Rice actually has her office down the hall from me. And she and Joel Klein, the chancellor of the New York City Schools, at the time wrote a report for the Council on Foreign Relations, which stated that our education or our, the problems with our education was a security problem, a national security problem. When I first saw this, I thought, this is really hyperbole. You know, it's OK, but it's a hyperbole. <clears throat> then I thought about it a little bit, and I actually agree with it. And um, I'm going to try to fill in the details of that. Now, the details I'm going to start with um, come from the fact that economists over the last 25 years have begun to think more about economic growth. And why economic growth? The reason why we get more prosperous over time, we, you know, we do better, why our children have done better than we have and we did better than our parents, is economic growth. Because increases in productivity are what lead to increases in the economic well-being of the nation. Now, what I want to show you is a simple picture. Um, this, and I've, this is going to be a little statistics lecture. lecture. I'm going to give you a graph here and, and show you what it is. Um, uh, on the horizontal axis is something called conditional test scores. Forget conditional for a second. I'll come back to that. But think of it as test scores of what people know. So think of it as taking a math test around the world and recording what people know. And the vertical axis is growth rates. Um, conditional again. And all of these um, little notes here are countries. So Peru and South Africa and the Philippines, Singapore, Taiwan, and Korea uh, up at the end. And there are two things about this picture, one of which is going to be obvious and one of which is less obvious. The obvious part is Countries line up on a pretty much a straight line. That countries where test scores now are this math test that's marched around the world, countries where people score better on math tests grow faster. Let me tell you what conditional is before I tell you the second thing about this graph. Conditional means the following. In the background behind here is a simple statistical analysis that recognizes one other fact about countries. And that is, where did they start in income? Oh, and by the way, I didn't tell you. I should have in the title. This is average annual growth in GDP per capita, aggregate national income, over a 40-year period from 1960 to 2000. So it's long-term growth, which is the important thing. That's why, that's why we are the richest nation in the world today is because we, over the uh, 20th century, had the highest growth rate of all the nations in the world. Um, we started at a good rate, a place, but we had the highest growth rate. Now, conditional means that you take into account where people started in 1960. Um, and why do you do that? If you start behind, all you have to do is copy what everybody else does. And it's easier to copy than to innovate. If you started in, at, ahead, you have to invent things. And that's harder. So it's easier to grow fast for a while when you start behind, because you just have to copy what everybody else is doing. But once you take into account that simple fact, you get this line. Now, the second thing about this that you probably have trouble telling from the picture itself, uh, but I'm going to uh, beat on a little bit, is that 
This is a very steep line. This is a very steep line. Um, and one way to see that is that if you said, well, if Peru, instead of having low test scores, low ability to do these math problems, and I'll explain that in a minute or two, um, had the, the average of the world, it would have grown 2% per year faster for 40 years. Now, some of you, particularly in, in this day of zero interest rates, realize that 2% is a big number. Okay. If, in fact, if Korea had been the world average, it would have grown 2% slower per year. These are numbers that add up to a big number. Um, there's a quote that's really hard to confirm, but Albert Einstein is reputed to have said that the most powerful force in the universe is compound interest. Um, and that's what's behind this, because this is annual growth that's compounded over time. Now, <coughs> what people have spent a lot of time with, and economists have been confused about, is doing the same picture, but just looking at years of education. So if we take years of education as the measure of the human capital, the skills of the nation, and we have conditional, same conditional starting income against growth rates, you see that there's this positive line there. Um, the countries aren't as close to that line. They're more scattered out to that line. That's the first thing you should see. The second thing, there's always a hidden thing behind all of these pictures that you don't see immediately. But the second thing behind this line is that it's wrong. Because once I take into account what people know, their math scores, you get a perfectly flat line that says there's no relationship between just years of schooling and growth rates once you take into account what people actually know. So this took me a long time to understand. You know, I, I puzzled over this. This didn't look right until I finally realized what this says. This says, if you go to school and you don't learn anything, it doesn't count. <laughs> and that's what this says. Um, and that's what is a message that we're going to have throughout um, this whole talk. Now, this is the ratings of PISA is an international consortium, the developed countries of the world, OECD, give tests every three years now of math and science. That's why I talked about math, taking a math problem around the world. PISA and the OECD actually does this. This is a ranking of countries. Shanghai isn't quite a country, but it starts out at the top. But you have Singapore and Hong Kong and Korea and Taiwan and Finland. Finland, Posse Salberg is going to talk about Finland, which has been one of the heroes. Um, and the striped line here is the United States. First in the world in 2000 in math and science. This is 2009, and we are far from first. I'm going to point out a couple other countries, three other countries on this, because I want to talk about them in specific. Whoops, wait a minute. Um, before I do that, I'm going to go back to George H.W. Bush and the governors in 1989, who said, what if we became first in the world in 2000? So what I'm going to do is say, well, let's take the picture we have of how growth rates are related to achievement and just say, well, if that holds in the future, what would that mean for future GDP, future national income, if in fact we were first in the world in the 10-year in the period that they talked about? This was 1989. By 2000, we were going to be first in the world in 2000. Here's the picture. Now, the picture is, point, look at the green line first. These are years from 1989 
meeting in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and we're going to be first in the world by 2000. And then I project that out for um, a long period of time. Um, and the vertical axis here is how much larger would GDP be compared to doing nothing? So if we were first in the world in 2000 versus whatever we've been doing. And the green line shows how GDP would start to grow if we had success by 2000. Um, um, and then the blue line says, well, maybe we couldn't make, quite make it by 2000. What if we made it by 2010? Which I've already tipped you off. We haven't quite done it yet. But um, uh, what would have happened according to history? And I've drawn in one other thing here. Total uh, spending on K-12 education in the U.S. is about 4.5% of GDP. All, all in, adding up local, state, federal spending on GDP is about 4.5%. And what this says is, first in the world by 2000, if we got out to 2014, these lines cross the green line and the red line. Now, what does that mean? Well, that suggests that had we actually been first in the world by 2000, K-12 education today would be free in the sense that the added GDP from the added skills and growth in the economy would totally cover the bill for K-12 education. Now, if it took to 2010, it might be a few more years, five more years or so, um, the, the, next, the next president would get the free education, according to this. And then it keeps getting bigger. Right? So that's the first story about things are bigger, um, perhaps more important than you thought. If you could pay for all of our education and stop these horrible fights in the state capital about how much should we spend for education. We could just pay for it out of the bonus in GDP. So let me point out, go back to the original graph. Here's the United States. And let me point to Germany, um, Canada, and Finland. Those are for various reasons. So Germany is there because I've done a lot of work on economic growth with a German colleague. And so anytime I, we look at education, we've got to have Germany there. But Germany is also within the range of where we are in terms of performance. Um, the, lots of countries have gained enough to make up the difference between the US and Germany. In Canada, I mean, Canada is sort of the US but colder, <laughs> right? Um, and, and so, but they're doing much better than we are. But if we could only be Canada, we'll, we'll look at that. And then Finland is the hero of the world that you're going to hear about when Crosby gets Posse Solberg. <laughs> so what I want to do is the following. I want to project out, much the same as I did for being first in the world in 2000, I want to project out what it would mean for the US economy to get to Germany, Canada, or Finland. Okay, um, And then I'll do something more. So we're going to look at the value of higher skills getting there. And then I'm also going to look at what would it mean if we had in fact, gotten to all kids proficient by 2014, sort of a version of No Child Left Behind. Um, and here's some answers. What I've done is project out for 80 years. 80 years is an arbitrary number, but it's the, somebody born today is the life expectancy of 80 years. So it's over the life expectancy of somebody born today. How much bigger would GDP be than if we did nothing? And I'm just adding up all the additions to GDP if we had the same growth impact of achievement 
that we saw in the last half century if that carried on into the future. So I'm just taking that graph I showed you, that straight line, and sort of saying, what would that mean? And then, oh, by the way, and then there's one other thing. Um, most, most of you are younger than I am, but uh, I don't care much about 2095. Okay, I'm not going to see much of 2095. So I care more about immediate things in the future. So I'm going to weight things that are today a lot more heavily than things in the future. And it's just like an interest rate. I'm going to weight them at 3% interest per year, which is I'm going to discount the future. What that means is that I'm going to put all of these additions in terms of current day dollars. And I can compare them. And the comparison here is the present value is of being Germany is $43.8 trillion. What's a trillion dollars? Well, we have about a $17 trillion economy total today. All in is $17 trillion. So we're talking about something on the order of close to three times, maybe not not quite three times current GDP for being Germany. Or another way of saying that is that over the next 80 years, the average GDP would be 6.2% higher each and every year for 80 years. Put that in the context of all of the discussions in Washington about the fiscal problems and the overhang of Medicare and Social Security um, or any other problems you want, or put it in terms of concerns about distribution of income and so forth, 6.2% is a big number. And it, another way of looking at it, I, I keep trying to find ways, because I don't understand what a trillion dollars is. But I, um, another way of looking at this is that that's roughly each and every worker in the US would get a 12% higher paycheck every year for the next 80 years. Okay, so like everybody just gets 10, 12% dropping out of the heavens for being Germany. So obviously when we get to Canada, we get to bigger numbers like $82 trillion. Or Finland is something over $100 trillion. I mean, these numbers don't make any sense, right? right. But what, they, <laughs> what they're saying is that the magnitude of, in the slope of that line, historic line, between the skills of the population and growth rates is really steep. Now, let me finish it off by saying, uh, well, what would happen if we got to NCLB? And I'm going to use a simple, uh, what does NCLB or proficiency mean? Well, in these international tests, we can actually do it. They, they score people as level one or level two. And level six is um, uh, the kindergartner who can do calculus. Or, or not quite that, but level six is really advanced. But level one is, level one is the following. Level one says, um, I flew here from California um, and I paid $650 for my airplane ticket. The exchange rate between the dollar and the euro is one to 1.1. How much did my ticket cost in euros? And that is a problem given to 15-year-olds. And 15-year-olds who, who are at level one can reliably solve that exchange rate problem. 24% of US 15-year-olds cannot reliably solve that exchange rate problem. So it's not Newton's calculus that we're talking about, but it's, we're talking about something very much simpler. And getting to NCLB is almost like being to Canada in terms of the impact on GDP and growth rates. By having a more skilled population, we would grow faster. Productivity would improve at a more rapid rate, and we would get the benefits of it. So that's the story. Um, anybody who had a number larger than $111 trillion coming in here. I apologize that I insulted you. 
that you, you did know how important education was. But I assert that most people, including myself, had no sense of the value of achievement for the US economy. Now let me bring it back down a little bit to Missouri. Um, in Missouri, if you look across the states, um, the average growth rate of GDP per capita at the state level income, think of that as average incomes, was 2.2% for the US over the last 40 years. Missouri grew at 1.2%, seventh lowest in the nation. Part of that, I think, comes from looking at where Missouri is. This is the National Assessment of Educational Progress, NAEP, where they test eighth graders around the whole nation in uh, math. About the same group as the 15-year-olds that are tested for the PISA test around the world. And all those other previous tests I was talking about were for essentially the worldwide PISA test. Um, there's the US average, right about in the middle. And there's Missouri, which falls below average in terms of the current achievement of um, eighth graders. And I think that this is a statement in general that there's a ways that could be moved in Missouri as in as in the other states. Um, in order to get the gains in Missouri income and the national, national income. Now let me put this in a different perspective. Here is, here is a ranking of states and countries. So I've taken what I had before, the, the PISA test, which are this international test, and I've shuffled in states of where states fall against countries. Uh, the green line is the US average. Anything in blue is a foreign country, and anything in red is a state. So you have Massachusetts, which is sort of within shouting distance of the top. Um, and you have Missouri, that is fighting to keep up with Italy and Spain. Italy and Spain are the basket cases of Europe. Okay, and that's the challenge of not the, the countries that we would normally want to be compared to. So you might say, well, we got more difficult to educate population, et cetera, et cetera. So let's look at just where white students in the US fall compared to international countries. Same coding, blues are international and <coughs> reds are uh, states. Massachusetts is white students are closer, the average is closer, and Missouri um, is um, somewhat below the average on this. And, um, you know, I'm not sure how far you can read, but here's um, Austria, Denmark, Slovenia. France, France, come on. Um, uh, <coughs> this is the comparison group. And so that's the challenge of where, um, how's Missouri doing in sort of the not so well. Um, so what can be done? And um, there's been a lot of research on this, and I think that there are some fairly straightforward answers. Um, number one, we could improve teacher quality, um, and a lot of people support that. Um, number two, we could improve teacher quality, and you've already figured out number three, good audience. Um, uh, the research suggests that to a first approximation, the thing that counts is teacher quality, and that good teachers are worth a lot, and not so good teachers are not. Um, and so I want to fill in a few details on that. Now the big picture, um, the big picture is the following. Um, and this is 
sort of common discussions. If you go to the reception beforehand or the reception afterwards, people basically say, yeah, we all recognize that uh, good teachers are essential to the operation of the school. And I've, I've never met anybody who disagreed with that statement. In general, however, there's a but. And the but is, oh yeah, but it's so hard to change. So let's stay with what we currently do because it's really hard to change. And the summary, bottom line, of the discussion to this point is that you have, there are very different economic futures depending upon which branch you think is more important and which you follow on the top. Um, now, part of this, I should say, is what I think is an obsessive attention to the current problems, if you, largely in Washington, uh, which obsesses about lots of things, but they've been obsessing about the 2008 recession since 2008. Mm -hmm. And they have been doing this to the extent that it drives out all other discussion, such as what we should do in the long run. Now, the best estimates of the total cost of the 2008 recession until last year are that the total cost is about one-tenth the value of getting to Germany in terms of the economic impact. The cost is one-tenth of that number of getting to Germany. Um, and yet there's very little discussion that I've heard of since 2008 that would suggest anybody looking at the longer run picture as opposed to what happened with the recession. Um, so let me, let me get down to teacher quality for a minute. This is getting into what can be done. Um, <clears throat> we now have some pretty good estimates of how different our teachers in terms of student achievement. We can say fairly confidently what is a top teacher going to do in terms of the achievement of her students? And what is a bottom teacher going to do? And we know the variation pretty well of the value in terms of a student achievement. Now, when a teacher increases student achievement, I'm going to look at the long run impact of that because we have substantial evidence to suggest for individuals, people who know more earn more. And we have good estimates of what is the economic value in the labor market of knowing more, of having higher achievement. So all I'm going to do is put those two facts together. I know how much different teachers affect achievement, and then I know how much achievement affects earnings. And I'm going to try to calculate what does it mean for the students in a class to have a really good teacher this year versus a not so good teacher or an average teacher. And here's a picture. Let's look at, um, well, let's look at the top line. What this this is a complicated graph, <laughs> and let me explain this in some detail. Um, what I have here is first, it says class size. It's really the number of students that a teacher effectively has. It's not class size, but if, if a student uh, teaches four math classes, uh, one fourth of her time, and, and sees on a, a total of 30 full-time equivalent students or something, that's what this is. So a teacher with more kids has more influence because over time, that teacher is affecting more students. So that says that the value of being a good teacher goes up with the larger number of students that a 
uh, teacher teaches. So that's not, nothing different there. Zero here is an average teacher. Um, so I'm going to compare everybody to an average teacher. I'm going to take the solid line as a 90th percentile teacher, a really good teacher, right, is in the top 10% of all teachers. And this line says, what's the value in terms of the labor market impact on her students from being a 90% teacher compared to an average teacher? And this line keeps going up. Let me drop back instead of 90% teacher is really top. Let's look at a 75th percent te teacher, percentile teacher, which is not, it's a good teacher, but not a singularly good teacher. A class of 30 with a 75th percentile teacher will, on average, for the total class, earn a present value of $430,000 more than the kids who had an average teacher, according to all the estimates we have. Each year, this is one class one year, raising the quality of the students. And it has a, a remarkable impact. There's been some confirmation of these numbers, by the way, of recent study by uh, Harvard professor Raj Chetty and his colleagues that looked at the impact of primary school teachers in New York City and then went to the IRS tax returns for all the kids in New York City and found out their future earnings after they'd gotten through school and out in the future and saw that these numbers are essentially what they were seeing in, in round numbers. Of course, you realize that there's also a, um, another side to this picture. There are the 40th percentile teacher, the 25th percentile teacher, and the 10th percentile teacher. And those numbers, compared again to an average teacher, suggest at the end, at the extreme, is that there are some teachers out there, the bottom 10%, who, according to all the estimates we have, are subtracting $800,000 in present value terms from students when they get out into the labor market. <clears throat> this, to me, says, um, this is important enough to pay attention to because we're talking about huge influences on the future lives of kids. What do we know about teacher quality? Here's where it gets, starts getting a little bit tricky. We have had extensive studies over a 50-year period now of the characteristics of teachers that affect achievement. And we have this list of characteristics that have been extensively looked at that, as a first approximation, do not have any systematic effect on achievement. With one asterisk, I'll get the asterisk in a minute. Having a master's degree, with you, most of you people look like you've been parents either now or in the past. If you walk into the school and the principal joyously comes up to you and says, you, you get a master's degree teacher this year, you should realize that that has no information about whether the teacher is going to be above or below average. There's a big variation. Um, <clears throat> whoops. Experience has an asterisk because in the first two or maybe three years of teaching, people get better. They learn something because it's a tough job. Teaching is a tough job. There's no doubt about it. And they learn their craft in the first couple years. But after the first couple years, a fifth degree, a fifth year teacher on average looks as effective as an average 25th year teacher. There is no impact of experience on average. 
There's a big variation at any year of experience, but there's no impact on average. Um, the same for fully certified teachers according to the certification requirements of the state that require a variety of things to get your teaching certificate. Uh, where you were prepared, whether you went to a traditional education school or to a liberal arts school or what have you, um, and how much professional development you've had. So this is the normal list that we talk about to identify teacher quality. And the research quite consistently suggests that these do not differentiate effective and ineffective teachers. Now, <clears throat> we do have evidence that supervisors can identify at least the extremes of the distribution. The very good teachers and the very poor teachers can be identified. Um, I think that the evidence, it's not evidence, that I think that the situation is broader than that. I think that everybody in a school, all, all the teachers can tell you who are the really good teachers and in particular who are the teachers who shouldn't be in that school. And frankly, I've never talked to any teacher in casual conversations did, didn't suggest that there was at least one teacher in his or her school that shouldn't be there in terms of their effect on students. I actually think it goes beyond that. I mean, most parents know fairly soon whether their teacher is particularly good or particularly bad, might not know what to do about it. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the janitor in the school knows. I mean, that, that there's no uncertainty about who are the really good and who are the really bad teachers. What there is is a hesitancy to have any policies that relate to that information. Um, it also says that it's really hard to regulate teaching by just pay or rules. You know, when the State Department writes the rules for teachers, you shouldn't pay too much attention to them because we don't understand what are the characteristics and the background that's important. We know that teachers differ, but they are not readily identified in ways that you could write down in regulations. Now, one of the other parts of this <clears throat> is the way we pay teachers today. Um, this is uh, years of experience on the horizontal axis and salary, average salaries. This is 2007. It could be any year. I mean, it, it, what you know is that teachers get paid more with experience each and every year, and they get paid more for having a master's degree. So that this is the uh, teachers with a BA degree. How this is for the U.S. How average salaries go up with experience. And then there's this jump for master's degrees at any point in time. And if I put it all together, um, over half of our teachers today have master's degrees. And so that amounts to, if I took the total salary bill for teachers in the United States, 9.5% of that bill goes to paying bonuses for master's degrees. And, oops, keep pushing the wrong button, sorry. 85% of the teachers have greater than two years of experience, and that's 27% of the total salary bill goes to paying those bonuses. And you say, but wait. We said that those were not systematically related to effectiveness. And they aren't. And that's what, we're, so we're paying a lot of money now for characteristics that aren't very closely related to effectiveness. Um, <clears throat> so if you say, well, if we're going to change anything, where would we get the money? Um, 
So there's a range of approaches to thinking about teacher quality. Um, one is a favorite of economists. Why don't we align pay with performance? Radical idea. Um, what it takes is evaluations, which historically, until 10 years ago, you could say, well, evaluations of teacher, teachers was meaningless. 98% uh, of all teachers were superior, good to superior, uh, by across the country. That's starting to change. So that teacher evaluations in many places has changed to be much uh, more differentiated and to identify differences. Um, and then it sort of says, well, if you see a very successful teacher, why don't we reward her? Because you want to make sure that she stays in the classroom, that she continues to teach. And economists generally think that rewards encourage people to stay around. But that doesn't quite do it. So if I just give bonuses to the good teachers, what happens to the totally ineffective teachers, the ones we identified that probably shouldn't be in the classroom? Well, you know, they, they might grumble because they'd rather have more money, but they're happy with their job. Um, so to me, and here's where it gets controversial, and I hope we haven't handed out the tomatoes or something to the audience, um, that you have to consider what I would call the zero option of not paying the small number of teachers that are harming our kids. Um, now, let me, I have sort of did some estimates based again on what we know about the range of teachers. And there is some uncertainty about the difference between good and bad teachers. But let me do the following experiment. <clears throat> I'm going to line up all of the three and a half million teachers in the country today in terms of how effective they are from worst to best. And we'll put them all in a single line starting in Kansas City. And it probably stretches to maybe Columbus or something, you know, when we line up all these teachers. And then I'm going to do the following experiment. I'm going to start at, the, at Kansas City and replace the bottom 1% with an average teacher, or the bottom 2% with an average teacher, and try to see what would that mean for US achievement. So here's the picture. I've called it the percent deselected, the, the percent that's replaced by an average teacher, not a superstar, just an average teacher. And you know, if, if it's 0%, you don't get anything. The vertical axis is standard deviations of performance gains that don't pay attention to that so much. It's just that's achievement on the vertical axis. And what you see is that the larger the proportion that are replaced, the higher average achievement in the US would be. How high? Well, this says that if roughly 8% of the teachers were replaced by an average teacher, we could get to the level of Canada. Okay, quiz, what, what was Canada? $82 trillion, right? Um, now, actually there's some uncertainty here. I, call this the low estimate of teacher effectiveness. What does low mean? If there wasn't any difference among teachers, if all teachers were identical, this experiment would get no results, right? Because I replace any teacher with an average teacher and they're all the same. So it doesn't do anything. So the closer the distribution, the more narrow the distribution of teacher quality, the less impact you would get from this. And what this red line is, is sort of the lower bound of plausible estimates 
of the variation in teacher quality. So this is the most condensed distribution. But there's an upper bound that has a wider distribution of teacher quality that's plausible. And the upper bound is this blue line that says, hmm, maybe it's only 5% of the teachers that you have to replace with an average teacher to get to Canada. Now, what's, the, what's 5 to 8%? Well, if we have 30 teach, teachers in a school, we're talking about somewhere between two and three teachers that we're going to replace. Um, uh, not quite two and not quite three teachers in this experiment. And just to reinforce it, well, 8% might even get us to Finland, uh, sort of out of sight. So um, this is, this is uh, sort of a demonstration that maybe we should think about bigger issues in terms of policies. Now, the one thing we know is that almost none of this is directly related to just putting more money into schools. If we had a fleet of helicopters come over Missouri with $100 bills in them and drop them on schools, we should not expect any change in the results. That's what, that's what the evidence suggests. Um, we can look at cross countries, within developed countries, within developing countries. There's a lot of, of evidence on this that money per se is not it. It's how the money is spent and not how much is spent that is the important issue. Here's another view of the world. This is between 1990 and 2009, the increases in spending per pupil that's adjusted for inflation across different states. And here is the test score gains on these NAEP tests, these national tests over the same period. The, this roughly flat line is how added expenditures across states relates to achievement. This roughly uh, elliptical red line is Missouri, which has, in fact, spent a little bit over, uh, increased spending a little bit over the average for the nation over the last 20 years, and in fact has gotten a bit less than the average test score gain over that period. But what you see is that, well, there's some, Massachusetts is, if you're, if you're spending, in or, if you're interested in spending, you point to Massachusetts, which spent a fair amount and has high achievement. <coughs> if you're on the other side, you point to Jeb Bush in Florida, where Florida essentially is spending the same in real terms now as 20 years ago and has the third highest increases in achievement um, of the nation. And then you see states scattered everywhere else. It's just this open picture. So this is the uh, <coughs> simple statement that it's not just resources. Um, now, my list, I'm going to go over this list fairly quickly, and, um, uh, which perhaps will allow us, I'm, I'm not sure of the timing, this may allow us some time for questions at the end. So I'm going to go through the uh, list fairly quickly. But uh, there's considerable evidence that good accountability for schools um, is positive, that having a good accountability system that holds schools responsible for results has positive impacts on learning. That's no child left behind, which is a, a bad law by most standards. I mean, a, a bad law uh, from my standards uh, in terms of the way it's written. It doesn't do the right things. But as a bad law, it still had a positive impact on achievement in the US. 
Um, I think that there's an argument that you should have more local decision making. People in state capitals and people in national capitals are not very good at designing how education should be delivered, but it should, in fact, rely upon local people that know both their capacities and the demands of their students. As long as they're held responsible for the results, you let them have more flexibility. Um, and then I think there's an argument um, in the evidence. This is, this is sort of an evidence-based story I'm giving you, that more parental choice of schools has a positive impact. Now, in each of these cases, these are not silver bullets. They don't magically transform education, none of these, but all of them have a positive impact and are things that add up to better performance. And I won't talk about it because it's not quite in this story, but there's also good arguments that better preschool, particularly for disadvantaged kids, not for everybody, but for disadvantaged kids has a positive impact and deals with some of the huge and unacceptable achievement gaps that we have in the US. But, remember this, does achievement matter? Is the US competitive? How is Missouri doing? Are there things to be done? Now is the time for the chorus. <laughs> and I'll stop there and hopefully answer um, some questions. <laughs>